Good afternoon, colleagues, and to our dear participants. I am Dominic Daita, a faculty member at the School of Statistics and part of the UP School of Statistics Research Committee. Stat Speaks is an ongoing initiative with the Research Committee to foster a community of research and knowledge sharing through colloquia on past and current research conducted by active members of the field. Before we begin, uh, we would like to remind the audience, the participants, of the following guidelines for participation in today's talk. Please keep in mind that the audience requested to reserve their questions for the Q&A forum at the end of each presentation. The audience are enjoined to use the raise hand feature of Zoom to facilitate the Q&A forum in an orderly manner. The audience may also use the chat feature of Zoom to relay their questions, and the audience may send their questions to everyone or privately to the moderator. Finally, whether asking the question live or relaying it via the chat box, the audience are enjoined to use the following format when asking questions. Please include your name, the university, institution, or agency to which you are affiliated, and of course, your question. We recommend that you use this format in order for us to better uh, course the questions that you have for today's talk. In today's Stat Speaks, we have with us Dr. Miguel Francisco Remolona, Assistant Professor at the Department of Chemical Engineering, involved with the department's AI program. They are also currently the director of the Dindaman Interactive Learning Center. Dr. Remolona is doing research on how Industry 4.0 can be incorporated to the industry as well as current chemical engineering education and practice. His main focus is on knowledge management in the data and information paradigm in chemical engineering. This includes gathering, storage, use, and access of information, as well as how to convert data into meaningful information. He uses a variety of tools that are frequently used in artificial intelligence, such as ontologies and machine learning with classical, statistical, and deep learning frameworks. Please be ready with your questions. Dr. Remolona's presentation will last for about 25 minutes, after which we will have a Q&A session. Dr. Remolona, our technical team, will now transfer the spotlight to you. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, there we go. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, apologies, I thought it was 30 minutes, so hopefully I could do this really quickly. Um, in any case, um, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you to your school, School of Statistics, the faculty and the students for inviting me here. So let me just share my screen so that we can start um, the presentation. Am I sharing the right screen? Uh, yes, sir, to? I think so. Okay, thank you. So, um, yeah, so here's my... Um, Again, I would like to thank you for inviting me for this seminar and uh, also my friends and my advisees and my colleagues who are attending here, uh, who are probably not part of the School of Statistics, but they still uh, came here to support. And uh, now I'm going to talk about communicating with computers and essentially delving into natural language processing. Essentially, in, we're going to talk about why this became my research, even though I'm mostly a chemical engineer. I started uh, my journey in research as a chemical engineering undergraduate. And then my master's also was in chemical engineering. And even my PhD is in chemical engineering. But uh, essentially what I did in my PhD also has something to do with artificial intelligence. That's, that's why I delved into natural language processing. Anyway, so um, moving forward, I'll just give you an overview of what I did for uh, my PhD and how, I, uh, how this problem uh, came to me essentially. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to recreate uh, Watson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Watson. Watson is the IBM supercomputer that was used in Jeopardy. So it was able to answer natural language questions and uh, try to formulate, um, try to understand the questions that were formulated in Jeopardy. And my advisor just asked me, what would it take for us to build something similar for chemical engineering. Now we realized that there's uh, a lot of things that we needed to build. Like one of the things that we needed was how do we actually store information and knowledge? And one of the th things we looked at was on using ontologies, but it doesn't have to be limited to ontologies, but it's the only semantic storage that we've found so far that is satisfactory. 
However, ontologies don't really have data. Most of more, more often than not, when ontologies are made, it's just the base framework. It's like in a database, you only have your uh, your schema, but there's no data in it. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to automatically populate these ontologies, and this is where information extraction was necessary and was key. And information extraction includes natural language processing. So essentially what we wanted to do was from PDF annotate or academic journal articles, we wanted to extract as much information as we can from the natural language and then put it into our uh, knowledge management system or more specifically into our ontologies. And the reason we wanted to do this is similar to the motivation be behind Watson. And we wanted users uh, end users, scientific queries, end users to be able to query scientific, um, semantically this, these ontologies. So they should be able to ask scientific questions. Um, here is a more detailed view of what uh, my dissertation was about. And essentially what we're going to be focusing on in this seminar or in this presentation would be the text processing, essentially entity recognition and concept detection, as well as relation extraction and relation clustering. However, in the over the course of the presentation, I'll be referring to both of these as just entity recognition and both of the relation extraction and relation clustering. Sorry, I realized my mouse was off. Uh, both of these entity recognition and concept detection as entity recognition and then relation extraction and relation clustering as relation extraction. So, Essentially, what do we want to do when we're trying to extract information? Well, we want to be able to identify key terms in the text. So one example here is an old example that I use in some other presentations. But uh, essentially, what we want to do is identify which, which words or which terms are actually significant for us as, uh, as researchers. So one of those things is probably what are terms that are related to medicines because this is talking about the biologics revolution in the production of drugs. And then what are, what are the targets of this medicine? So what are the parts of the living organism that are mentioned in the text? And then what are the processes involved when these interact? And then we also have other supporting information. But is this the entirety of natural language processing? We are able to extract, we are able to identify um, key terms in our text. Right now, this is just the start. Identifying key terms and uh, identifying key terms and trying to identify how they are related to one another is just the start of natural language processing. It doesn't really model um, the underlying framework or the underlying knowledge that is stored within the text. Like if I extract all of this uh, information, if I extract all of this data, the meaningful terms, and try to relate them to one another, have I truly, um, essentially, have I captured the essence of what that paragraph is trying to tell me? And this is the challenge that I am currently trying to solve. Essentially, how do I model this knowledge such that, because it cannot be modeled usually um, by PDEs or ODEs, which we usually do in engineering. Like almost all of our equations, all of, almost all of our problems are solved by ODEs. And PDEs. It's very rare that we have statistical analysis, but sometimes there are when we're analyzing our data. But in terms of like predictions and everything, how do we do that when we can't relate it to those we are we are used to? And then we want to be able to do this. Sorry, didn't move forward. We want to be able to do this uh, modeling such that we can answer the questions that we want to ask, so that you can answer semantic queries. Uh, semantic queries being those that are um, innate, the questions that you usually tend to ask in conversation. The next one is how do we actually accomplish this automatically? And the reason we want to do it automatically is because there's millions of papers that are being published every year. And being able to extract information from that by reading it is going to be more and more complicated as the number of publications increases. And the other thing is that the reason why this is a problem for me is because non NLP tools designed for non-technical domains don't necessarily work well in the engineering domain. I mean, right now, there's uh, the concept of transfer learning, but it doesn't necessarily mean that um, 
the old data that you have or the old models that you have would automatically translate to the problems that you're trying to solve in the technical domains. So I guess for some people that are not yet familiar with natural language processing, here's a brief overview of what natural language processing is. So essentially what natural language processing is, is trying to make a computer understand natural language. And what natural language would be would, is the way humans would communicate. So if I'm trying to, like right now, I'm speaking in English and English is a form of natural language. So is Tagalog. And so are all of the other ways that we can communicate with one another. Even sign language is a natural language. But of course, that would be more difficult for a computer to process. In any case, um, so a computer does not necessarily communicate that way. I mean, it communicates with us, us that way, but essentially it stores the information in zeros and ones. It doesn't really have any form of understanding of what you are trying to say. But isn't understanding language easy? Because we as humans can do this. We tend to associate AI or artificial intelligence into doing things that humans cannot easily do. But we as humans, we can easily communicate with one another using natural language, right? We can, like right now, this talk would, or this uh, seminar wouldn't be happening if we couldn't communicate. And we already know that there exists like devices such as Alexa, Siri, and Google who can respond to some of your questions. Uh, unfortunately, I have mine unplugged, so no one will answer if I call any of them. But uh, we know that these devices exist and you can ask them questions. However, if you talk to them for about five minutes, you realize that you're not really having a conversation. You're not really talking to them and you're not, they're not really answering your questions as you want them. Like for example, if I ask Alexa where, uh, what natural language processing is, it, pro it will probably give me the Wikipedia entry, the first paragraph of the Wikipedia entry for natural language processing and it will read it out loud to me. As for Siri and Google, it might search for the term natural language processing and show me the results. So it's not really that meaningful in terms of how much understanding can I get from asking the question to these devices. And to be able to actually process language, we need to be able to make models of our language. And that's what language models are. Most of the language models, um, at least in the mid, in the early 90s to the mid 2010s were statistical in nature, uh, starting with n-grams to hidden Markov models to conditional random fields, uh, which is where it kind of tapered off at around 2015. And then it, they were later replaced around 2015 by recurrent neural networks because they were amazed at how accurate recurrent neural networks were in natural language processing tasks. Um, those tasks include those that are written here uh, generative models, first memos, there you are. Generative models, classification, um, or entity recognition for that matter, as well as parts of speech. And eventually these recurrent neural networks were also overtaken by uh, transformer models as we know them right now. So just to give a brief overview or a brief history of uh, some statistical methods in natural language processing, as well as how I use them during the course of my uh, journey in natural language processing. So this is one of the most basic uh, statistical method in uh, natural language processing, which are n-gram models. It's essentially a type of Markov model wherein your next state is determined by your previous states. Like for example, uh, here, we're looking at the word has, there's my mouse again, we're looking at the word house, has, and essentially what we're trying to determine, what's the probability that the next word is has, given that the previous word is patient. So that's what n-gram models are. Um, and essentially the main weakness of n-gram models is that it is limited by the amount of words you have in your data set. Like what combination of words, what unigrams, what bigrams, what trigrams are there in your data set? because the probabilities are computed from your data set. So essentially we're just counting. We're counting how many unigrams, how many times did the word patient appear over all of the, all of the words in your entire data set? 
How many times has the bigram patient has appeared divided by all of the bigrams in your data set? So essentially, that's how we compute these probabilities for these n-gram models. Uh, another limitation of this n-gram models is that it's not really good at generating text. It won't be able to create essays for you, unlike the, uh, the next ones, which are the hidden Markov models, or in fact, transformers are really good in generating text. But still, these, uh, these n-gram models up until uh, 2015 were still used as part of feature sets for more complicated NLP models, including the next one, which is hidden Markov models. Come on, move. Oops, there you go. <coughs> okay, so now hidden Markov models essentially for text processing allows us to uh, do classification because of the existence of a hidden layer. This hidden layer uh, is where we assign the classes of each of our words. And where you are, there you are. And essentially, um, the first or the first classification that they were they did with hidden Markov models was for parts of speech tagging. They were able to identify, and that's the example over here. They were able to identify which part of speech a particular word would be, and then using the transitions for what parts of speech is probably next. Um, they were able to uh, use these hidden Markov models to predict the parts of speech for sentences that no matter how long they are. Um, however, because of the existence of the transition and the transition probability for hidden Markov models, there's an intrinsic label bias for um, hidden Markov models. And I'll show that in the next slide uh, as I show also that for us to be able to give labels to do this classification, we need data sets that are inherent to the task that we want to do. So I'll have, I have two examples here, wherein this was done in my lab by uh, undergraduate students, wherein the first one here, uh, Banzuelo Calma and Trinidad, uh, added annotations to my already existing data set. So in my PhD, I annotated about 7,984 um, terms uh, in for uh, machine learning purposes. And then uh, my students, Masuelo Calma in Trinidad, added about 5,000 more data, data points to that uh, data set. And this uh, annotation is about pharma the pharmaceutical engineering because that was my target domain at that time. And this complicated tree at the bottom here, this one, is what they use to be able to annotate. Like each of the terms, they're looking which ones, uh, which uh, class does it belong to. Now for a more simple uh, annotation, we also did um, annotation for variable typing. Essentially what we wanted to figure out here was where were the variables? And then what were the definitions of these variables? What are the units of these variables? And then finally, what are the uh, magnitudes of these variables if they are constants? Like if, if a specific variable has a, a value, like for example, here there's a zero, the one in pink. So we try to figure out which one of these, uh, which one of the variables is actually related to that constant. And <clears throat> so, now here we can see the problem with uh, the problem with hidden Markov models in terms of trying to assign labels. The most common label that follows no label is no label, because there's a lot of text without any label. And because of this, maybe in our data set, there's probably like eighty to ninety percent of anything without a label, the next term also does not have a label. And because it's 80 to 90% and we're optimizing per, uh, using hidden Markov models, you're optimizing per term. What would happen is that almost all of the terms would be labeled as no label, thereby having a classification that didn't really work. And one of the ways they fixed this is in the hidden Markov model, 
uh, instead of using hidden Markov models, they use conditional random fields. And essentially, they just remove the transition probability. They change it into a probability that these two are connected. Like these are the next are uh, are connected in series. That these two would occur together. That these two labels would occur together. And that and that changed the optimization to a sequence optimization, from a sequence optimization to a global optimization, which reduced. But did not necessarily eliminate the label bias. Another annotation that uh, wasn't done in our lab, but we use sometimes is for, for other scientific uh, data is the Kempner corpus, which is a data set about chemicals and drugs. And we also have the, we're all, we also use the data set for uh, genes and proteins from the Genia, uh, Genia corpus. So, now that the task is classification, we need to be able to identify the performance of our entity recognition and our classification. And the way we do this is by using the following metrics, the precision, recall, and F1 score. Um, I'm sure some of you are already familiar with these. As these are mostly, um, these are very popular metrics in classification and entity recognition. And precision essentially is a measure of type one error and recall is a measure of type two errors as uh, we might know already in our basic statistics. And then F1 score is trying to balance these two uh, precision, this, these two metrics. Essentially, if we want to bias more with, more with regards to precision or to recall, we use the F score instead and change the one from zero to infinity, depending on what we need. So uh, one of the uses that we had in uh, for, or, I mean, we used conditional random fields in one of our uh, research in trying to identify metabolic pathways. And um, what we used here was actually the Kempner corpus, which tried to identify drugs as well as chemicals that are related to metabolic pathways. And what we did was we... Uh, we looked at articles that did not include the metabolic pathway itself. So not so from published work, it's not including the published work about the metabolic pathway. So this is the gold standard metabolic pathway for caffeine. So this is the one that was done by a human. And essentially, we looked at the article that, that uh, mentioned this or that uh, proposed this metabolic pathway. And then we looked at the references of that uh, article. And then we used those to try to essentially build our own metabolic pathway. And the first one, the first two, the caffeine and paracetamol were done by Aligato, Africa, and Sanchez. And they were able to obtain 77 and 70% F1 measure. There's another metric here called overgeneration. And the reason we have overgeneration here is because um, there's extra terms, there's extra nodes that were created because uh, these were also detected as entities by our entity recognition. So, and then Liwag, Ordinario, and Tanquirido tried to streamline everything. They tried to make it end-to-end, -end, just feed the text and then see if it will uh, extract the, um, if it will give you the metabolic pathway and how correct that metabolic pathway is. Unfortunately, because of the streamlining without any curation in the middle, um, they were only able to get 30 and 43% for their F1 scores for celecoxib and Tramadol. Um, and this is one problem that I've encountered during my uh, PhD dissertation, wherein when I was annotating data, certain words have more than one label. Like and the example here would be radio ligand binding data. And radio ligand refers to a biological entity, essentially a chemical that binds to your, uh, to certain proteins. And then you have radio ligand binding, which refers to the process of that ligand binding to the said protein. And then you have radio ligand binding data, which is essentially the results of the experiment that you conducted for uh, attaching that radio ligand into the, your protein. 
So there's three different concepts in one phrase. And essentially, it's it's mentioning, uh, essentially, there's a lot of information that is packed into that sentence. And trying to identify the label that I should assign for each of these is uh, can't be done using traditional um, entity recognition methods. So in this problem doesn't just exist for domains wherein there's a large number of classes. Like there were 26 classes in the previous annotation that I showed you in the pharmaceutical uh, domain, pharmaceutical engineering domain. But in the uh, mathematical or variable typing information extraction, there were only four classes. Well, actually five because they added equations, but only four were relevant, uh, relevant classes. And even still, there's a, there's the existence of uh, multiple labels for one uh, phrase. Like for example, molar flow rate of species i is actually the definition of this uh, variable here dot n underscore i, but i is also a variable. So there's two classes that are essentially labeled for this this variable i. And what I tried to do, this was around 2016, 2015 to 2016, was to perform multi-label classification using just a basic support vector machine. So I didn't even use a hidden Markov models because I couldn't find an equivalent for hidden Markov models for multi-label classification. So I just used a single, a simple uh, support vector machine, but I used the n-grams as well as the parts of speech as part of my feature sets in trying to, or as part of the dimensions in my SBM model. Now for the Homer model, essentially uh, what I used here is just uh, the base classifier for Homer is also SBM so that I can check the, uh, essentially what I'm trying to compare here is if the performance of the system would be better using a multi-label classifier as compared to a multi-class classifier. Multi-class, you can only assign one label per word. For multi-label, you can assign multiple labels per word. So essentially, this is the result of uh, this is the result of that experiment. And we were able to get better performance, at least for one case, a BIO case, which I'll explain later. But for the BIO case, we were able to uh, get a 64% F1 score, which is actually comparable to um, entity recognitions at this time, at around 2015. Uh, this was the performance of entity recognition systems at that time. And uh, BIO refers actually to beginning, intermediate, and others. B meaning a beginning of a term, intermediate meaning the next, the not the beginning of the term, but also part of the term. And then others would be those words that are not part of any terms, words that did not have any label. Um, yeah. And then afterwards, um, after 2015, there came recurrent neural networks. I didn't use recurrent neural networks because I didn't trust them at that time. Uh, I was a late adopter, uh, adopter of uh, neural networks for natural language processing. Uh, simply because uh, I, there, it's a black box and I didn't want to play with things I did not really understand. So, but recurrent neural networks have their advantages. Uh, they were able to perform better than the CRF models of, uh, of the prior research. However, they still have their weaknesses. And I'm going to explain one of them here, which is uh, essentially how you pass data from left to right in recurrent neural networks. And this is similar to how you pass data in hidden Markov models, except there's a squashing function, which essentially makes your, uh, your transitions nonlinear. However, you're still passing information. So for example, here, what time is it? You only get 50% of the information from what? when you're looking at time, you're looking only at 25% of the information at what, when you're looking at this. So it's exponentially decreasing. I'm uh, about to go over time, but anyway. Um, anyway, so 
one of the advantages of RNNs, uh, sorry, so essentially it's exponentially decreasing with length. However, LSTMs and GRUs tried to mitigate this, but they still didn't completely, um, completely eliminate the problem. And, but one of the advantages in using R RNNs was that we were able to vectorize words. We were able to, um, we were able to use words that were represented as vectors, as vector numbers, continuous numbers, instead of just a single, like in the pre previous examples, they were just either there, this word exists, this feature exists. So essentially they were just um, ones and zeros. It either existed or not, did not. Word embeddings made it continuous. Um, however, these word embeddings are actually generated using the same feature sets that you had before. So using those feature sets, you're just measuring cosine these distances of features as well as using dimensionality reduction afterwards to be able to generate these uh, word embeddings. And then finally, the last part of the talk is about transformers, wherein we use um, essentially the the, the key advantage of transformers is that it's easily parallelizable and it adds two important encodings. Attention encoding, essentially, if you have a long sequence of words, which word should I pay attention to? So that's what attention encoding is. Then you have positional encoding, which tries to identify what uh, essentially uh, in a vector, it adds a sine or a cosine of a certain... Um, a sine or a cosine to that word so that it's able to identify where this word is in the entire sequence. Uh, the advantage of transformers goes beyond just the amount of length in the, um, in the what do you call this? The, the, the length as well as the parallelization. Transformers actually reduce the error rates of, of NLP tasks uh, up to around 50%. So 50% of the error was removed from 60% accuracy to around 80% accuracy is actually the biggest contribution of transformers. And we use this for mathematical information extraction. So what we did here, instead of using CRFs because transformers were already a thing, is we tried to use CRFs for this and we got F1 scores of around 77%, which is comparable to... Uh, competitive to uh, literature, given that we were we were the ones who annotated these data. And well, a group, different group of students annotated the data. But, um, and here's the breakdown uh, below of the F1 scores for each of the metrics. Uh, magnitude was a little hard to identify. The reason being is that it followed the same format as variables. So most of the magnitude terms were classified as variables instead. So uh, I guess last three minutes, uh, last would be relation extraction. So now that we can identify text, we need to be able to connect them. And this, this, this connection used to also be try, uh, determined statistically, but now it's transformer based. Uh, the statistical methods were uh, context-free grammars and then lexicalized context-free grammars trying to identify how the parse tree should work. Uh, I'll show you a parse tree later. But transformers in the statisticals are both still non-optimal since parse trees are big. And this is an example of a parse tree. So you have a sentence and then the sentence has a sub-sentence, the first one, and then you have a connector and then a sub-sentence. Then you have your noun phrases, your verb phrases, so on and so forth as you go down. So essentially you break down a sentence into a noun phrase and a verb phrase. You break down your noun phrase into a noun phrase and a propositional phrase, so on and so forth. But this sentence here isn't vague. Uh, the sentence that I want to mention that's vague is, for example, a dog saw a man in the park. What's vague there is we don't know if in the park refers to the man or it refers to the dog. Was the dog in the park or was the man in the park? So unless you were actually there to see it, you wouldn't know which of these were true. But the statement, a dog saw a man in the park still makes sense. But because we don't know where to relate the prepositional phrase at the end, which, which uh, noun we should relate it to, 
it becomes vague. And this is one of the reasons why relation extraction has very poor performance even up to now. So we tried to apply transformer-based variable uh, relation extraction to variable typing. So the mathematical information extraction, now we have definitions and we have terms. Now we're trying to relate which ones are definitions of which variables. And we got accuracies reaching around 60.3%, um, depending on the limitations that we set. And then final word, um, after all this, can we truly say that we, our computers understand? Have we really truly communicated with computers? What we did was we identified key terms in text and then possible relations in that text, and then applied these techniques. At least what I showed was actually mathematical information. I showed some with pharmaceutical information extraction, but that's still a uh, work in progress. Um, but I think right now that's like just part of the pie. It's not really the entire thing. We, the computer really doesn't really understand anything yet. It can process information, but not yet to the, uh, to the point that it understands it. So in my opinion, that's why we, it's necessary to have proper knowledge management and integrate this knowledge management with natural language processing for true understanding. Uh, that's it. So if you have any questions, um, you can type them out. Sorry for being, well, 10 minutes late. Uh, and Or if you can send me an email if you, we don't have any more time for questions. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Dr. Remolana, for that wonderful talk. Uh, I hope we were uh, I hope we were able to give you much more time than this. Uh, I, I I bet you had a lot more coming uh, with what you wanted to discuss, but uh, unfortunately, a uh, limited structure. I understand, but uh, right now we would like to open uh, the the questions. We, we will start with our Q and A session. So, like you said, uh, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to send them in through the chat following the format. Uh, prescribed, or you may also use the raise hand feature uh, in Zoom to, to send in your questions directly. Uh, anyone would like to ask a question? Maybe to start, I'd, li I'd like to ask uh, a very general question to Dr. Emolana. Uh, so we know that right now the field of, let's say, uh, biology and uh, genome studies has already been taken over by uh, AI, but I was actually pleased to know that you were in the chemical engineering department. So is artificial intelligence already a widespread movement uh, in chemical engineering or is this more of an emerging practice right now? Uh, I would say it's been emerging for at least 30 to 40 years now, but uh, it's not that widespread yet um, simply because uh, like getting access to chemical engineering data wherein you can use machine learning is um, I would say like you would need access to data from plant data, like production plant facility data, which usually they keep close to their yeah. secrets, right? So it's really hard for us to, I mean, that's why there's a lot of research being done, but in terms of application and using it in industry, um, very few have actually done the, the integration. Yeah, I, I can imagine what you mean about that. The, the data would be quite siloed. Of course, yes. other researchers would not be willing to, to send their data to other researchers uh, in the fear that they might get scooped on their findings. But uh, thank, thank you for that. Uh, any other questions from, from the participants? In the process, pa nila, sir, yung, yung talk mo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. That's NLP fun. does tend to be quite... Oh, there we go. Uh, from Teodoro Nicolas Dulay. Uh, you may unmute your mic. Hi, good afternoon, sir. Um, yeah, first, uh, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Uh, it's actually quite interesting. Um, what I wanted to ask was about actually your last example. Um, you mentioned that the language is vague because of the location of the modifiers. And this is typically the case, right? When you write... We have a tendency to misplace our modifiers. But generally, uh, isn't the rule, at least uh, for uh, grammatically, isn't the rule usually the word nearest to the modifier is what it actually modifies? And if so, 
But, um, has there been um, work in NLP where they sort of give um, maybe a loading of the probability of this word actually describing the nearest word? Parang there, there's actually, even though you say it's a rule, it's not really a rule. <laughs> that's fair, sir. <so> that's fair. <laughs> it's a it, rule. It's more, of a, it's more of a guideline, right? It's not really yeah, like yeah. everyone needs to follow that uh, that statement. And more often than not, in, even in writ, written literature, there's lots of uh, violations to that rule that you mentioned. And as... I mean, we have grammatical rules, we have this grammatical constructs, but English itself violates those rules. Um, simply because English is a live language. So when people speak it, they tend to violate those rules. And once you start to process those, if you, you that's, this is one of the reasons why the rule-based approach prior to 1990s didn't really work. Because even if they applied all of the grammatical rules, even if they applied, because everything before like 60s, uh, 70s, everything was rule-based. Like uh, this was the time of expert systems or this was the time of uh, automatic theorem improving. So even in language, they applied these things. They applied, um, they applied all of these rules together, but they realized, you know, we can't even generate good, like good English sentences by following these rules. You have to violate some of the rules so that you can generate a meaningful sentence. So it's it was a uh, it was an early discovery. Like I wasn't even part of. I wasn't even born yet. But yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. I agree with that, sir. A lot of what we think in language as rules are really more rules of thumb <laughs> than anything. But actually, I'd like to play on that. I was thinking about that as well. Uh, before, uh, when you were talking about the, the genesis, essentially, of NLP research, uh, there was a time when it was all parsley after parsley, POS tagging. Uh, language does tend to be vague. But I'm wondering if, based on your observation, does that carry over to the same degree with the kind of texts that you're working on? Because uh, since you are dealing with more academic nature uh, texts, they, they do tend to be more rigorous, more reductive in structure. I think part of the trouble that I'm having is because it's more reductive, so there's less words to work with. So essentially, course, yeah. uh, they're trying to compress as much information in as little words as possible. The, the, I mentioned radio ligand binding data. like Just those four words, you could create a sentence from that and it would still have the same meaning, right? And because it was redacted into those four words, it's harder to identify like what does that mean for a computer like how do i actually extract the information I want from that so but then again yeah for some rules yes it's easier but um again transformer based models change a lot of things there's a lot of block boxes there's a lot of things i don't understand on how yeah. they work but uh, they change a lot of things because they improve like the predictive capabilities of these models Thank you for that, sir. Um, we'd like to invite the audience to send in more questions. To go, we're waiting for another question. Uh, I'd like to ask as well, uh, what, what are you envisioning here as, uh, as the future of, of this research, uh, this research track that you're following? But, uh, a lot of researchers, for example, Watson, uh, and a lot of NLP researchers and gusto nilang gawin is still talking ro robots, robots that, that, that we can talk to, that we can do reservations for you uh, and the likes. But in the field of chemical engineering, for instance, uh, what's your vision of success uh, in this field of research? More than just in chemical engineering, because I've Ever since after I graduated, I've expanded into more fields. But um, essentially, what I wanted to do is, if I can, if I can extract information and use the information I extracted to build an ontology, so to build a knowledge management framework, uh, isn't it essentially the same as trying a computer learning by itself fundamental connections between information? Right, 
And if that is its initial knowledge base, if I can add to that, isn't that adding knowledge for the computer? So essentially I'm teaching it to learn. So that's at least for now, that's that's the that's a goal. It's not an end goal, because teaching a computer to learn is uh, like learn in terms of human understanding, not just learn in terms of like machine learning, um, because it's machine learning is essentially just trying to tune probabilities and uh, essentially tune parameters in numbers so that it's able to represent what humans are trying to do. But what I'm trying to say is trying to get a computer to have the same fundamental arrangement of knowledge as a human being. Because every human being, ontologies are more than just a construct by artificial intelligence. It's actually a philosophical concept uh, regarding your view or your outlook in the world. So if you can build one that's essentially, um, I'm going beyond statistics and uh, the science, <laughs> but if you can build one that it, but if the computer can learn one on its own, I think that's a good first step in trying to understand our own learnings. I see that. that's a very bold vision, I have to say. We're, we're moving beyond <laughs> teaching yeah. computers to speak, uh, to understand language, but to actually grapple with the kind of knowledge that we humans deal with. But it's a very exciting field, actually. Uh, I'm very excited to see uh, NLP yeah, yeah. research being used in fields outside of the usual uh, NLP data sets, uh, tweets, uh, news articles. Yeah. So it's very interesting to see what kind of research uh, other academics like yourself are producing when taking those same methods uh, into new fields. Maybe for just one last question, for uh, if there was a big jump in your accuracy scores from F in your F1 scores uh, when you were using the usual CRF models uh, and then you changed to the transformer-based uh, models, that was a very large jump from a 50%, 49%, I think was the best one, to almost 80 70%. Um, based on your observation, though the transformer model is more of a black box, what do you think may have contributed to that big leap? Well, is it a matter of parameters? Because even though CRF models are uh, are also a global optimization. So the transition between CRF and hidden Markov models is essentially the same as the transition between transformers and recurrent neural networks. You're looking, instead of looking at the sequence wherein you're looking at the next word and the next word, you're looking at the entire thing. However, for the key contribution of transformer models is the attention. So attention, uh, the paper is attention is all you need. Uh, it's a very good read if you have time and if you can uh, understand what they're trying to say there. But um, essentially it allows for like, even if two words are, let's say there's an entire sentence in between two words or maybe not a sentence, but a subsidiary clause. Like, for example, when we're writing research papers, we like to use the word uh, which, right? So which does something, 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 and then there's a continuation of the sentence, right? So you have this word, and then after the which clause, you have the next word. Transformer models are able to identify that these two words are related. So the attention modifiers tell you, okay, don't pay attention to this entire sequence in the middle, pay attention to this. Or also pay attention to this entire sequence, but uh, this is related to this. This also has a higher score compared to the which state, or not the which, the other words in that subsidiary clause. So I will pay more attention to this word compared to uh, the other words in the uh, subsidiary clause. Now, there, because it's able to do this, it's able to identify more connections and able to like, Essentially, it removed the entire thing, the entire which state, which clause from the processing and as if these two words were connected side by side, which CRF models couldn't do. There's skip chaining in CRF models, but it's a little erratic in how it works. Uh, so there's skip chaining, like they're trying to also do the same thing that transformers were doing, but they didn't work as well as what transformers are doing right now. See, yeah. 
So yeah, that's, that's, actually, the, that's, that's the main reason for the job. I have just one, two more questions here from one person. Um, I, I feel guilty about hogging the time with my questions, but uh, we have a question here from Ray Cuenca from the MSUIIT. So their first question is, as a researcher focused on NLP, do you have any recent updates with regards to models that are way better than transformers? And number two is, what is your say that recent NLP research is leaning further away from classic statistics taught in the academy? Yeah, actually, because... Transformer models as well as neural networks are black box models. They are leaning away from um, they are leaning away from uh, standard statistics, but still you're using feature sets that are based on statistics. Like the n-grams are still there. You're still using them as feature sets for your transformer models. Uh, you might not see them in the foreground because they're all being computed in the background, but they're still there, uh, especially when you're computing the vectors. The word vectors, the same word vectors are also being used in transformer models. And when you compute them, um, because of the feature sets, they're still, uh, um, because of the cosine distances between feature sets, they're still statistical in nature. Um, and then, but of course, the final output, it's hard to put statistics in the final out, relating the final output to the initial input. Uh, what was the first part of the question? I uh, the forget. first part was question was, uh, are you aware of any models that have been proposed that are way better than the transformer model? I haven't seen anything, um, but because transformers was transfor the transformer model was a huge leap in terms of conceptualization, and I'm not sure if you've seen how easy it is to compute uh, transformer models in terms of just the linear algebras involved. And how like how straightforward it is to compute these things, and because it's just purely linear algebra, you can use your GPUs for it. Your so it's easy, really easy to parallelize, and those two things are really hard to replace. Like parallelization, uh, getting an algorithm that's really really easy to parallelize, at the same time has really good um, the jump in logic from using. Uh, for using the attention modifiers, uh, those two things are, are like a huge jump in logic. I don't think there's anyone who has another logical jump from that. Maybe there is, but they haven't published it yet, or they're still trying to prove that their idea is worth pursuing, but I haven't heard of anything else. I agree. It looks like based on uh, computation alone and also its improvements in how it processes the data, it looks like right now it might, it sounds like something to be a gold standard for a while. I'm not sure if you've heard of GPT-2 and GPT-3, uh, but these are just large models, but they're still using transformer models. Essentially, uh, the, the only difference is their, I think their neural networks are using uh, billions of nodes. So if you have a supercomputer that can have, has billions of nodes and you can create your own, and then essentially the performance of this is close to human beings, GPT-2 and GPT-3. So like they can generate essays for you. Um, yeah. they, can, uh, they can essentially analyze text really, really well, but it's not scalable. It's hard to train it for scientific purposes. All right. So thank you very much, Dr. Rimmel. And I hope we could keep you longer to, to pick at your brain more. Uh, we've learned a lot from you. I think even our audiences are, are still processing a lot of what was said today. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, we are constrained with time. And uh, But either way, that, that was a very good uh, short talk that you gave us. Uh, and the UP School of Statistics Research Committee uh, is honored at having, had, at having you grace today's stat speaks with your presentation. Uh, for you. this, uh, we would like to present you, sir, with the following Certificate of Appreciation. Uh, Thank you. The University of the Philippines School of Statistics awards this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Miguel Francisco M. Rimolona in graceful recognition of his expertise and invaluable service as a speaker on communicating with computers as part of the UPSS Colloquium on the Statistical Sciences, given this 21st of April, 2022 via Zoom, signed by the Director for Research uh, of UP School of Statistics, Dr. Imogen Evidente, 
And of course, our Dean of the UP School of Statistics, Dr. Joseph Ryan Lansangan. If you are joining us today through Zoom, can we all show our appreciation to Dr. Ramalona by giving a virtual thumbs up or a virtual applause? Virtual thumbs up. Thank you. Once again, thank you very much, Dr. Ramalona, for your talk today. And thank you, everyone, for attending today's Stat Speaks. We would like to invite you to the next uh, colloquium to be held by the UP School of Statistics Research Committee, this time with Dr. Erniel Barrios of the UP School of Statistics on his talk on the non-parametric test for volatility in cluster time series. This will be happening on May 5, 2022 at the same time time. At the same time, we would like to invite you to fill up our feedback form. The, UP, uh, the research committee is always welcome to receiving your feedback in learning more from how, to we, how we can improve our future activities. And also, please subscribe to the UPSS mailing list to get more information regarding future activities, talks, and other announcements from the UP School of Statistics. Once again, this has been Dominic Taita from the UP School of Statistics, and thank you very much for attending today's Stats Speaks.